again Friday evening and, and all day yesterday um, to spend time with him. And so, uh, so that I don't speak so much, I'm going to let my wife, who can probably better uh, describe our trip. So. Um, okay, thank you. Um, first of all, for everyone who's been praying for us, it's been a neat journey. But um, we spent the day Saturday with Logan and his grandmother, actually great-grandmother and great-grandfather and his half-sister, and they were very welcoming to us. Um, Logan was interacting and playing with us and um, starting to build a relationship with us. Um, some of the neat things that, that happened just to give you a little glimpse, but um, the kids were climbing up this, you know, kind of roots on the side of this, and Logan got to a point where he wanted to get down, and um, he had really connected with Mike earlier in the day, and he said, can you catch me? And then he just jumped into his arms, and it was showing me the trust that he's building with us. So um, that was just a piece of it, but I'm fine. Um, <laughs> All right. But um, he, um, by the end of the trip, was you know, hugging us and you know, saying, when can he see us again, and all that kind of thing. So it was very positive. Um, he'll get along great with our boys. They were wrestling and playing football and running around together. So we were encouraged by the trip and are just going to continue to walk the path that the Lord has for us. Okay. I knew that if I said that, it would take 30 minutes. So Havila is definitely the woman for the job. We're going to release the kids. You guys can go down and enjoy your time in teaching. Last week had a bit of a moment where, uh, where I recognized that we had missed something very important. And uh, this is obviously what we're going to do right now is, is something that not only fits with the message of the morning, but it's just, it's something that we need to do as a, a way of honoring and, and thanking. Um, and so if you have served in the military, this past week we celebrated Veterans Day. And uh, if you've served in the military, could you, could you stand up? And we would like to at least give you a, a hand um, for your service and for your heart to serve our country. Uh, it's, go ahead and look around guys and ladies. It's, um, it's, all right, you guys can sit down. Thank you. It's not only, um, you know, that we need to honor who these men and women are in their service to our country, but I know that in the time of serving, it brings us to a place of need many, many times. And I'm sure that if you talk to any one of these veterans that, that are in our congregation or any abroad, they will be able to tell you of needs that arose during their time of service. And as we talk about you know, going out and, and liberating the lost, I often think of war movies that I see where there's POWs. And there are always in those movies and, and actually even in some stories that I've heard of real accounts, there are always men and women, people who are willing to risk for those people that are trapped, for the people that are captured, for the POWs. There has to be someone that's willing to go in and rescue, go after them. Otherwise, they'd be forever a prisoner of war, probably die in that state, and many have. And so I want us to, to link the, what it means to be one who is willing to go and serve, just like these men and women that stood up this morning who were willing to go and serve. 
Maybe they were called to duty. Maybe they volunteered. But they are willing to go. The question that we have to ask ourselves this morning is, knowing that there are prisoners of war, that there are those that are captured out in our community, in our neighborhoods, in our workplace, are we willing to be the ones that are going to serve and are going to go in after them? You know, in those movies, you see that the prisoners of war are malnourished and, and they're weak and they're just in a place where they've sometimes given up hope. Others are clinging on desperately to, to a hope that may happen or may not. That is the case for many, for all who don't know the Lord. Yes. They're clinging on, they're desperate, they, they're malnourished, they, they don't know how to. They don't even maybe see any light at the end of the tunnel anymore. And it's our place as God's people, as his chosen people, as ambassadors, as those who are his disciples, to go out and to find these who are, who are captured and who are in such desperate need. So why is it important that we are used to set people free from the darkness of sin and death. I want you to think about that for a moment. And Kirk, we're going to... Is the other video ready? Okay, we can skip it then. Let's do it at the end, if we can. Um, the Therefore Go video. The discipleship. We'll do it right at the end then. So why is it important? Let's just, for a moment, I want us to think about the worst place that you have ever been spiritually. Maybe it's something that's happened recently. Maybe it's been years ago. I don't want to linger on this for a long time, but I want us to remember where we've been. So just for a moment, just think for a moment about the worst place that you had been spiritually in your life. Okay, before too many memories start to flood in and, and those thoughts start to take a place. I want to first say that it's because the Holy Spirit intervened and helped you that any one of us was able to be set free from those things that were going on in our lives. And so all of us here have a story or a memory of what was going on in our lives in those desperate times. For some of us, it was the time in which we came to know the Lord. For some of us, it was, it was a turning point in our relationship with Christ where we repented and where we came back into a fresh relationship with him. But it was the Holy Spirit who directed and drew us back in to Jesus. And if I went around and asked for volunteers to talk a little bit about that time in their life, I would believe that I would hear that there were others who drew in, who the Lord put around you to help you in that time. Maybe, maybe for some of you it was an independent, you know, you had that relationship with, with the Holy Spirit and he drew you in and, and he, he comforted and, and brought you to himself. But for others, there were probably those around that helped and took part in that process. Ultimately, we give the glory to Jesus Christ and to the Holy Spirit for all of that. But I do want us to, to recognize that just as those POWs were waiting and, and watching for someone to come to the rescue, that's how the POWs of the spiritual warfare are at very at this very moment you know i can't help thinking about 
my own life and, and how the Lord ministered to me in that time of desperation in my life. And it was through the help of other people that came around and, and influenced and, and just even through questions started to, to prompt what the Lord was starting to do in my life. And when I think of that, it brings me back to a revelation that God gave me many, many years ago. And, and I'd like us to turn real quickly in our Bibles in Mark chapter 2. In Mark chapter 2, we have a story of a man who was very much imprisoned. He was a paralytic. He was unable to do for himself what needed to be done. There were times in his life where opportunity came, but he was unable to, to go and, and to be a part of the opportunity because he couldn't get himself up off the ground. It was at a point when Jesus was coming to town that there was a different thought that started to, to come about. And some of these, the friends of, of this man decided that this man needed help. He needed to be taken out of the captivity of his mat laying on the side of a road. And he needed help to get to the one who could for, for ever change him and free him from the bonds and the yoke of this prison that he was in. And these men, in verse 3 it says, They came to him bringing a paralytic who was carried by these four men. And when they could not come near him because of the crowd... They uncovered the roof where he was. So when they had broken through, they let down the bed on which the paralytic was lying. And when Jesus saw their faith, he said to the paralytic, Son, your sins are forgiven you. And some of the scribes sitting there and reasoning in their hearts thought, Why does this man speak blasphemies like this? Who can forgive sins but God alone? And immediately when Jesus perceived in his spirit that they reasoned thus within themselves, he said to them, Why do you reason about these things in your hearts? Which is easier to say to the paralytic, Your sins are forgiven you? Or to say, Arise, take up your bed and walk. But that you may know that the Son of Man has power on earth to forgive sins. He said to the paralytic, I say to you, Arise, take up your bed and go to your house. And immediately he arose, took up his bed, and went out into the presence of them all, so that all were amazed and glorified God, saying, we never saw anything like this. You see, today as we sit here, as we listen, we are people that have said, Lord, I need you. We are just like this paralytic man. We came to God with inadequacy. We came to God in need. We came to him unable to do on our own what needed to be done. And some of us came carried by others around us. I was one like that. But the ultimate thing is that a prisoner of war, someone in need who is spiritually deficit, they need to come to Jesus Christ. They need to have their sin forgiven. They need to have the blood of Jesus Christ running in their veins and the life of Jesus to be who they are and to give them hope, to give them a future, to give them insight as to what God's will is and what he wants to do. And this morning, church, I want to remind us because I know that you've heard this before. I know that you know these things, right? We can all say, yes, that's what we're supposed to do. But I'm here to remind us today that we have prisoners behind the gates of pride, behind the gates of materialism, behind the gates of 
of whatever sin is holding them back. And they're looking. They're desiring deep down to have that true freedom. We've talked many times about about the things that men and women, humans run after to try and fill the voids in their lives. But that void will constantly be there until Jesus comes in and frees them from the place in the pit that they're in. The paralytic had a need and he had an inability to help himself because he was crippled, he was blinded, and he was bound up by the different things that were going on in his body. This morning, I want us I wanted us to go back for a moment to that place where we were, when we were in that place of being bound and being blind and being crippled and in need so that we could remember that we were there, but we've been freed from that and we are now in a new life in Christ. You guys are pretty quiet this morning. Let me offer this little bit of a prayer. It goes like this. Dear God, so far today, I've done all right. I haven't gossiped. I haven't lost my temper. I haven't been grumpy, nasty, or selfish. And I am really glad of that. But in a few minutes, God, I'm going to get out of bed. And from then on, I'm probably going to need a lot of help. So thank you in advance and amen. Now that's, it's funny, right? But it's a reality. Each day, we have fleshly reminders of sin. We have a reminder of the need that we have each day for Jesus Christ. Maybe you're out there saying, well, I've been doing pretty good lately. That's great. But without Jesus, you wouldn't be doing anything. You wouldn't be getting out of bed each morning. That grace and that mercy that's fresh every morning, without that outpouring of Jesus every day, we are done. We are messed up. We are nasty. We are sinful. Because our flesh and, the, and our spirit war against each other, right? That's where Paul says, I do the things I don't want to do and I don't do the things that I know I should do. Because of that war that rages. So if that's going on in us and, and we're saved, we, we have that relationship with Jesus and that need is, is there every morning we're aware of it. What's going on with people that don't know him? The ones that wake up every morning and and think to themselves, here we go again. Ah, got to make it through this day. How am I going to make it through this day? Bills are mounting up. I hate my job. My wife is mad at me. My kids, I don't even know them anymore. How? How? Well, friends, this morning, this is what we're talking about. This is our call of duty. It is a proclamation of freedom to those who are in captivity. This is exactly what Jesus did while he walked this earth. And he wants to continue to do this through us as we walk this earth. Seated on the throne of our hearts. The light within us. He wants to proclaim And bring forth his rule in the lives, in the hearts, in the relationship with all. Isn't that awesome? I mean, we're approaching Christmas. We know that around that time of year, we really start to remember, oh yeah, Jesus came for the lost. He came to to serve, not to be served. He came as this little baby. But sometimes we forget that throughout the rest of the year. And we start to think about the gift that we've received and we want to keep it. 
Now, I'm not bringing this as a condemnation to us. I'm bringing it as a reminder that we are of the kingdom of God, that we are the servants, the ambassadors, the children of the king. And we have someone to represent. We have someone who fills us with love to give away. And he wants to do that through us. Turn with me to John 12. This has been something that's been going on throughout eternity, right? We've been suffering with this choice of sin. In John 12, we're going to read about how Jesus proclaims to the Jewish nation and how this struggle between believing or denying who Jesus is has been around. And it's been something that we maybe have seen in our own lives. It's definitely something that we can still see in this world today. But it's not a new thing. And so in this encounter, let's see in verse 37 where Jesus talks about the very need for himself. But although he had done so many signs before them, they did not believe in him. That the word of Isaiah the prophet might be fulfilled when he spoke. Lord, who has believed our report? And to whom has the arm of the Lord been revealed? Therefore, they could not believe because Isaiah said again, He has blinded their eyes and hardened their hearts, lest they should see with their eyes, lest they should understand with their hearts and turn so that I should heal them. These things Isaiah said when he saw his glory and spoke to him. Nevertheless, even among the rulers, many believed in him, but because of the Pharisees, they did not confess him, lest they should be put out of the synagogue. For they loved the praise of men more than the praise of God. And then Jesus cried out and said, It's all right. Let me say that again then. He who believes in me believes not in me, but in him who sent me. And he who sees me sees him who sent me. I have come as a light into the world. That so this reference is going back to Isaiah. You see, Jesus, again, is, is saying to the Pharisees, to the religious leaders of the day, guys, I am the way. And some even believed it, but because they didn't want to stick out, they didn't want to step out in faith in that way, they kept it to themselves. They didn't want to get cast out of the synagogue and, and, and lose what they had. But if we jump back to the reference in Isaiah 5, let me just speak to a few points. You don't have to go there. But this is what the Lord was showing Isaiah after Isaiah's lips had been touched with a coal. And he said, Lord, send me. Send me to be a voice. You see, the voice has been ringing out, the voice of God through men throughout the ages, and through God himself in Jesus Christ. But this is what Isaiah understood. God said, therefore my people have gone into captivity because they have no knowledge. Woe to those who call evil good 
and good evil, who put darkness for light and light for darkness, because they have rejected the law of the Lord of hosts and despised the word of the Holy One of Israel. Israel had forsaken God as its first love. Just as today, the prisoners of war, the lost souls, have forsaken God. Isaiah was sent with the message that God gave him. A message that ultimately said, turn to God. And when you do that, there will be healing. Today, we see many who are in captivity because, again, they have no knowledge. There has been a turning that good things look evil and evil things are starting to look good to our society. Can you see that? We see it all around. It's not, it's not hard to see. They're becoming blind to the reality of who God is and to the fact that Jesus is the hope of all. These are the things that we need to speak to. We have to be counterculture in these areas. When we see things going on in our community that are evil things, that people want to call good, we need to be the voice, just as Isaiah or the other prophets that spoke out and said, no, this is not the way of the Lord. This is not good. This is, in fact, evil. We need to call it, call a spade a spade, right? We need to be willing to go into situations where the Pharisees were afraid of what would happen, we need to be bold and courageous to say, look, that's not true. That's not the right way. That isn't going to get you anywhere except deeper in despair, deeper into hurt, deeper into pain. We need to be the representatives. We need to be the servants who go forth in that manner looking for those in captivity. And when they hear the message to turn, to repent, to give your life to the Lord Jesus, God will work. In fact, he's already working in many of these situations that we're a part of. Do you believe that? Candy Meadows, you believe that? We see things happening in the midst of our relationships, we see things happening around us where people are starting to, to have a little bit of a glimmer. Wait a minute. I, I think I heard about that before. I, I might be interested in, in knowing what you're talking about. I might be interested in, in who this Jesus really is. You see, the Lord doesn't leave us empty. He doesn't leave us in, in a place where, where we should be afraid. He says, no, I go before you. And so I encourage us this morning, in your relationships that you interact with people, whether it be at work, whether it be at home, whether it be your neighbors or something that you're involved in, start to pray and ask the Lord, who are you doing a work in that I know? Who do you want to use me with? in the, the group of people that I interact with. Lord, who are you opening away already so that I can be partnering and be active in what you're doing so I don't go at this by myself? You know, you see the Rambo movies, right? Stupid. Sorry, kids. I shouldn't use that, right? But it's Hollywood, isn't it? One man that charges in with a, M16 that only can carry so many bullets and yet it never runs out of bullets, right? And though he gets hit and you, you could see actually some of the scenes where he's shot down, but he doesn't die, right? That's just not a reality. You see, one person charging in is not going to do it. But when the Holy Spirit leads us into, an, into a situation, into a person's life, not a situation. Why do I say that? We're talking about people. We're talking about real 
people. Lost people, people that have needs, people that may, maybe they knew the Lord and, and it got so difficult that they fell back and just tried to do it alone. We're talking about lives. We're talking about friends. And when we try to charge in like a Rambo, going with what we think we've got, we will fail those POWs. We will fail the captive. Yes. We will probably become in some way captive. Here's the thing. God has given us a call on our lives as his people, as his sons and daughters, as his followers to go out, not like Rambo with as much ammunition as you can carry and a gun in your hand waiting to blow people up. No. To go out with love. To go out with a reality that I've been in a similar place that you are right now. And God restored me. He brought me out of the pit. He brought me up out of the muck and the mire. And he made me a new, new man. A new woman. That's the way in which we need to go out. With that understanding that God calls us to liberate the lost. To bring freedom, not of ourselves, but of who he is in us. Yes. I want us to understand this morning that there is a desperate need. There is a, a desperation in the eyes of people. Start to look. Start to ask. Start to ask the Lord to, to reveal that. And then also that we have a role in this. Our role is to listen, to obey, to trust the Lord, and to let him lead the situation through the Holy Spirit and through his love. You know, Jesus declared God's message. Not only that, he made the way of salvation. He revealed truth and he brings us into life. And he, he has all of that, the way, the truth, and the life for all who would believe. Yes. That is an offer that will never go void. It's an offer that, that we can always proclaim to anyone. And it has good. It's got a gold standard behind it. It's backed. Yes. We know that when we make that offer, that we can offer it with with an excitement about who God is and what he will do in a person's life. Throughout the Bible, it is chalked full of men and women who were used by God to reveal this very same thing. Okay, it's a basic concept that we have a purpose. God has a plan. Let's turn, if we can, to 2 Corinthians chapter 4. This will be the last place that we're going to go in the scriptures this morning. Paul was someone else who was used to reveal and further extend the message of God. To expound on the theme of the kingdom. That we have a king and his name is Jesus. You see, Paul was a man who was trained up. He was at the top. He was the cream of the crop yes. in regards to Pharisees, right? He was the one that was going out to persecute the church because they weren't being religious the way that the Israelites thought they needed to be. And what happened? He got knocked off his donkey, didn't he? He saw the reality of who Jesus was. That light was so bright, so pure, so right. It blinded him. It changed him. It brought revelation and understanding. You see, Paul didn't go, go forth after that and talk about how trained he was. He didn't go forth wearing a prayer box around his head. He didn't go forth, you know, trying to, 
to be puffed up and bloated, looking like a, a righteous, perfect person. No. His message was his testimony, right? When he went around, he didn't say, oh, hey, I'm, I'm Paul, I'm trained, I'm, I'm a Pharisee of all Pharisees, right? He, the only time he said that, in fact, was to refute what had gone on in his past yes. and to show people that it was because of Jesus that he was a man that had a plan, that he was a man that had a purpose. Let's read here in 2 Corinthians chapter 4. He says, therefore, since we have this ministry, as we have received mercy, do not lose heart. But we have renounced the hidden things of shame, not walking in the craftiness nor handling the word of God deceitfully, but by manifestation of the truth, commending ourselves to every man's conscience, conscience in the sight of God. But even if our gospel is veiled, it is veiled to those who are perishing, whose minds the God of this age has blinded, who do not believe, lest the light of the gospel of the glory of Christ, who is, in, who is the image of God, should shine on them. For we do not preach ourselves, but Jesus Christ, the Lord, and ourselves, your bondservants, for Jesus' sake. For it is the God who commanded light to shine out of the darkness, who has shown in our hearts to give the light of the knowledge of the glory of God in the face of Jesus Christ. You see, basically Paul is saying here exactly what we've just been talking about. It's not that I'm trying to deceive you with some kind of deep philosophy or theology of who God is. It's the recognition that we need Jesus Christ. You see, Paul was speaking to those who he understood because of what happened way back in Isaiah. That these people were blinded. That there was a veil going over their face by who? God? No, but by the God of this land, yes. the enemy of God, who would try to distort and bring confusion, accusation, lies, deceit, to kill, steal, and destroy, right? That's still going on to this very day. When we go out, it shouldn't shock us when we hear the stories. It shouldn't shock us when we, when we see the malnutrition, when we see the bones and the flesh hanging, when we see people in hard situations, in horrible places, it shouldn't shock us because we're told about this all throughout the scripture. What it should do, though, it should inspire us because, again, we've been there. We have been there. And God has done a work in our hearts to draw us up out of those places. We are the carriers of the hope of Jesus. I want, I want to just pull this out because it really jumped out at me as I studied this. And I'd never really, I just never jumped out like this before. But in verse 6, it says, for it is... The God who commanded light to shine out of darkness, who has shown in our hearts to give the light of the knowledge of the glory of God in the face of Jesus Christ. That, that is different than what I grew up understanding about this little light of mine, I'm going to let it shine. This little light of mine, don't, you know, don't hide it under a bushel. No, don't do that. You know, I grew up thinking this little light of mine, I thought it was my light. I thought it was because I was a good Christian boy that was doing what mom and dad said and, and listening at church. And I thought it was because of me. But it's not in any way. Now, don't hear me wrong and say, hey, we could do whatever we want and God's light is good, so it will outshine. No. We have a responsibility 
to let the light of Jesus Christ, which is the knowledge of the glory of God, the understanding of who God is. We have a responsibility to let him pour out of us to shine and to let others see who he is in relationship with us. That that will be the inspiration. That will be the excitement that people want to know Jesus Christ. We need to express not just a ray of the light of Jesus, not just a glimmer of who he is, but the spectrum of light, the full spectrum, which is knowing and having relationship with Jesus and living in him. Last week, I was talking to Ronnie Roos, and he was saying that in his time in prison, God broke him. He went in as a man that had a lot of things and, and he knew a lot of people and he had power and he had authority because of the things that he did in this life, in the world system. He went into prison and God broke him open and he revealed to him, Ronnie, you've got a lot of stuff going on that you think is, is good stuff because that's what the world has lied to you about. But I'm going to break you down. I'm going to show you that what you really need is me operating in your life. Relationship with me. And Ronnie started getting broken up. He started crying because he said, it's been in my brokenness that God has used me to let him be seen in my life. Can I say that to us this morning? If you're going through a hard thing right now, if you've endured battles and you've endured things that have put you to the test, those are not all bad things. Those are areas of our lives where God has done a work in us. And we can expose those times to people. Use those, those testimonies and, and our life to speak about how God is good and how relationship with Jesus Christ set us free from those things. That's what he wants to use. That is where the light of Christ can be seen. Finally, in verse 7, goes on to say, But we have this treasure in earthen vessels, that the excellence of the power may be of God and not of us. We are hard-pressed on every side, yet not crushed, Listen to these things. Listen. Apply them as they apply to your life. Okay? We are hard pressed on every side, yet not crushed. Yes. We are perplexed, yet not in despair. We are persecuted, but we are not forsaken. We are struck down, but we are not destroyed. Always carrying about in the body the dying of the Lord Jesus, that the life of Jesus also may be manifest in our body. For we who live are always delivered to death for Jesus' sake, that the life of Jesus also may be manifested in our mortal flesh. So then, death is working in us, but life in you. And since we have the same spirit of faith according to what is written I believed and therefore I spoke. We also believe and therefore speak, knowing that he who raised up the Lord Jesus will also raise up with Jesus us and will present us with you. For all things are for your sakes, that grace, having spread through the many, may cause thanksgiving to abound to the glory of God. Paul's basically breaking it down here and he's saying, look, it's not because of you. It's because of what God wants to do in you and what God wants to fulfill through you. It's because of Jesus Christ. So when you go through a trial, when you go through something hard, remember, you're not overwhelmed. Though you may be all of these things, we are not crushed. We are not destroyed. We are not dead. We are alive for the purposes of the kingdom and for the King, Jesus Christ. If 
Finally, I want us to think about some last points. First of all, God has filled us with a love for himself, hasn't he? Without that, we aren't able to love the Lord with all of our heart, soul, mind, and strength. He fills us and allows and encourages and brings that into our being. That we can share the truth of who Jesus Christ is in a loving fashion. Remember that without love, we're like clanging cymbals, right? Though we could attain the highest religious things, without love, they won't impact people who are suffering and in need. Because that's how Jesus came. He came in a love for us. We are also called liberators. We are in position to use the good and the bad. Now hear that correctly. Not the bad of what we can do on our own, but we are called to use the good and the bad in what the Lord has already brought us up out of. To speak to the understanding of how God brings freedom in our lives. We need to be a broken people so that we can free and help the blind people, the paralytic people, the captured POWs. Making disciples of Christ Lovers of God with all heart, mind, soul, and strength is possible. It is. When we express God's love and when we express the light of Christ, which is the knowledge of God and a relationship with Jesus. We're going to watch this video and the reason we're watching the video again is because I want us to see each week in progression and allow the Lord to build in us some understanding as we watch the video. So don't watch it again and, and think to yourself, well, I already saw this, Mike. We've already seen this video. But think of it today as a, as a liberator. As one who is there to go out after the lost, the POWs, the ones who need to know Jesus Christ.
For he looked down from the height of his sanctuary. From heaven the Lord viewed the earth to hear the groaning of the prisoner, to release those appointed to death, to declare the name of the Lord in Zion and his praise in Jerusalem. When the peoples are gathered together in the kingdoms to serve the Lord, the Lord calls us to set the captives free, to release the prisoners, because in the freeing of the captives, in the relationship of life in Jesus Christ, we no longer have a world that looks like a POW camp, but it looks like a worship service to honor and bring glory to the King of Kings and the Lord of Lords. Let's stand up and pray as the Lord encourages us to do these things. Father, today we, we come to you knowing that it is only through you that these things can occur. We are vessels, clay vessels, Lord, we need to be filled with your passion and your love. Lord, you have freed us from the bondage of sin and death. You have set us free from those things that would, that would weigh us down and discourage us. Lord, let us remember what you have done in our hearts, in our minds, in our families, in our lives, Lord. And let us be encouraged to want to see that in others. Let us be alert, Holy Spirit, to listen to you as you are always, always ready and always moving in the people around us. We thank you, Father, that you sent your Son to a world who had such tremendous need. We thank you that you sent him to us. And we want to further your kingdom and extend those who would glorify your name. We need your help, Lord. We ask that you would put this commission in our hearts. Lord, not just in our minds where we can say, yeah, the great commission is to go out into all the nations making disciples, baptizing in the name of the Father and the Son and the Holy Spirit, and teaching them to obey all these things that you've taught us. But Lord, help us to, to really let it sift down into our hearts in a deeper way. I thank you, Lord, for those that are going out and are speaking of your name, Lord. I ask that you would help all of us to do this more. Lord, to, to be transparent with, with our neighbors and our friends and our co-workers, Lord, to be transparent to a point where we're willing to share from our life who you are and the life that you bring to us. Holy Spirit, I ask that you would help us to be keen in these areas, to be alert to you, that we would not speak of ourselves, but that we would listen for your leading and your guidance. Lord, let us be encouragers to one another also. Help us to be in prayer for each other. Lord, remind us daily to lift up our brothers and sisters. Lord, we ask that you would use us as a unit, as your people, to bring about these things, Lord. I thank you, Lord, for the relationships and the love that you have given us, Lord. And I ask that your light, your love, would shine forth, that people can be set free. Lord, we know that you are able. And we ask that you would make us a people that is willing to spread your love and to spread your name. We praise you, Lord. I ask that you would fill our hearts and our minds with people right now 
that you would instruct us to go and to love. Thank you, Lord. We praise you, we honor you, and we lift you up. Go with us as we go out, in Jesus' name, amen. Amen.